Hello everyone and welcome to Don't Ignore the Elephant, the podcast where we talk about the stuff that no one else will, the elephant in the room. I'm Liz O'Riordan. I'm a breast cancer surgeon with breast cancer myself, and during my career, I've had a lot of elephants to deal with. I've learned that talking about them, getting them out in the open can help you know that you're not alone. And it's wonderful that we're building a community of people who want to talk about their elephants. Keep sharing them with me because together we can help each other. Whether it's cancer, grief, resilience or bullying, losing your identity, or simply how to get out of bed in the morning, there are loads of things that can be hard to discuss. I know how powerful it can be to hear someone else talk honestly about their own problems. I've carefully chosen my guests to help get these issues on the table. They've either experienced the elephant themselves or spent their life helping those of us who have them. I'm going to be asking the questions everyone else is too afraid to ask. This week's guest likes to describe herself as an ass kicker who looks like Beyonce in a bad light. I'm secretly hoping she can squat in heels. (laughs) Jazz Amplifar is joining me today to talk about resilience. As many of you know, life never goes according to plan and it can be incredibly hard to pick yourself up and move forwards. And I'm struggling myself after mum died a couple of months ago. But Jazz has done that on a global scale. And I can't wait to talk to her about how we need to celebrate and learn from people like her who have shown that it can be done. Welcome, Jazz, to Don't Ignore the Elephant. Thank you. And I can squat in heels. Like, yes. We're I all love good. this. We need a reel <laughs> of this happening, you and me. Oh, right. yeah. I'm up for that. Yeah. <laughs> how would you describe yourself to any listeners who might not have heard of you? Um, I am a resilience ninja. I mean, I don't want to sound like, oh, you know, I'm so good because I've done this. But the fact is I should be dead or lost in a world of sexual exploitation or in prison or addicted to drugs. And I'm not. And that is a huge success. I did the work. Don't get me wrong. But it's also that I was a people showed up for me and stood with me. So, I, yeah, I'm a resilience ninja. And I am a pound shop Beyonce lookalike. I love this. I love this. We're going to come on to cheap one. (laughs) Yes. This is your number. Now, we're going to come on to the ninja later, but... You've kind of taken the world by storm by going out and empowering people. But I don't believe, well, I know that you didn't simply wake up one morning and decide to change (laughs) the world. No. That power must have come from a pretty ugly place. And I know you've talked about this before in your TEDx talk, but could you share with the listeners just a little bit of what you went through as a little girl that kind of started you off on this journey? And it's it's interesting. I love that you say that because there was an element, there was a time when I woke up and thought, enough, I am tired of being tired. But that takes years of tiny compromises. And I grew up, so I'm brown, well, caramel top, uh, according to the paint chart in B&Q. I like to be accurate. Um, Not pharaoh and ball. No, I know. People sort of say, oh, can we or elephant breath? No, stoat. No. no. I want to be B&Q, basic, B&Q yes. is where it's at. So I was born, my biological mum didn't know she was pregnant. She was white in the 70s. Well, she's you know, always white, but it, she had a brown baby without a partner in the 70s. When it wasn't cool. No. Uh, yeah, so I was born as a bit of a surprise. And I just kind of lived through, you know, I was I was a, a girl in the 70s, brown, single parent, um, working class. Uh, I grew up with my grandparents for a little while, but then my mum got married to a, a terrible human being and we were abused, violently abused, sexually, physically. We were neglected, tortured. I spent a lot of time locked in the cellar. Seriously? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, like, I only talk about what I've processed, Liz, right? Yeah, so I'm not an idiot. My sobriety no. and is, is more, the most important thing to yeah. me is being all the coaching and the therapy and the work I've done is the most important thing. But when I talk about it and when I've written it down in my book, I look at it and think, you'd watch this as a film and think this is a bit yeah. far-fetched. But it, the, these are the extremes of day-to-day reality for a lot of people today they in are. toxic relationships. I didn't know that my biological mum was my mum until I had to go and live with her. And I remember thinking at six, she is not a safe adult. And sure enough, wow. you know, she was drunk all the time. I became the mum to my five brothers and sisters. Every year she had another baby with a different guy. I took care of them. I taught them how to steal food from a cake factory. They'd just throw them away. I took beatings for them. And by 11 years old, I was in that summer of no belonging between primary school and secondary school. And about to enter into puberty, that kind of, who are you? Do you want to grow up? Oh, my gosh. It was puberty. I remember watching, we were doing a sex egg video at school. I remember sat in the gym watching this video, messing about, throwing stuff. And we, we were watching seeds and tubes and eggs. And I... 
I was 11 years old and it suddenly dawned on me that what my stepdad had been forcing me to do for the last six years since I was five is how women get pregnant. And I just died. Jesus. I, I just died. And it's not like they show on the videos, is it? It's not... <laughs> <laughs> Daddy and mummy go to make a baby. It's like, yeah, that's not my experience was. Oh, can you imagine? And having that trauma in school, having to relive that yes. and have that realisation surrounded by your friends. Yes. And, and the adults who I assume knew what was going on and thought it was okay. So I ran. I ran away from home, ran away from school. I lived on the streets. I got picked up by a pimp who was a lovely guy, actually, and could teach some organisations a lot about belonging and making you feel yeah. like you're valued. And an interesting thing is that he took me shopping to buy clothes and I was standing in this change room holding a dress and I was breaking down. I mean, I, I didn't know the word sexual exploitation, but I knew I wasn't safe. Yeah. And I remember one clear thought coming to mind that changed everything. And that thought was there was no way that Mrs. Cook would wear this outfit. And she was a teacher I'd had when I was six. Yeah. But she like just filled me with this bravery idea. And because I suddenly thought she wouldn't wear this, so I dropped it, walked out of the change room, handed myself in at a police station I, across the road. I remember like going in saying, I demand the right to remain silent. So I thought that's what you did. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that's what they do on the bill and the telly. And, <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and then follows, you know, like years of foster care and being homeless, living on the streets and also getting to university whilst being homeless, you know, and having to wow. sofa surf. And then getting a degree and becoming a teacher and, and then empowering education through, you know, literacy, because that was my passion. That's reading, writing and spelling with my tickets out of mindset poverty. Yeah. But still ashamed and hiding my X Factor backstory all the time because I'm my biggest hope is that one day I'd fall enough people to think that I could be considered yeah. acceptable. Not that I'd be accepted, that I might as well wish to be a starfish, but considered to be acceptable. So we, I can tell you what the start I had as a kid, but actually the real struggle was the 40 years after that, yeah. navigating the truth about myself and the human I was designed to be, yeah. not the human I was forced into being by you know the world. Yeah. So, and I want to talk a bit more yeah. about that. See, listening to your story makes me think that my bullying when I was 7 and 13 at school was nothing. But to no, me... No, 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 oh, but, 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 I came on to that, but no, because I've realised again through having cancer, through depression... Your own shit is your own shit and it's really bad to you. And you need to yeah. stop feeling guilty that you're struggling when other people aren't because it affects you. Yeah. But that childhood trauma had a massive impact on my life. It turned mm. me into a doormat. Even now, if my husband says, what do you want to watch at the cinema? Whatever you want, because I yeah. hope you like me. It's that in, for yeah. me, it's that fear of they won't like me if I say no. Mm. How do you as children find a way out of that darkness? Yeah. How do you suddenly think, okay, I'm above this, I can move beyond it? I talk about my sobriety in terms of my own kind of mental health and well-being. I think it's, well, way of being, not well-being. I think it's like alcoholism. I think it's like leaving a toxic relationship. You don't do it on your own. Like no. what you just said, I love it. I, I always feel like we're in this whole disadvantage Olympics. And often I get, oh, it's not as bad as you. I'm not as bad. Yeah, it's my life's no shit. Yeah, we're not, it's not, we're not winning at being no. like miserable. <laughs> it's like winning a yoga yeah. race. You don't get to win. <laughs> but, but there's something around... Hearing the stories of other people, when, when I was, my son was 12, I've got three kids, and I said to him, it was just taking off, I'd done my TEDx talk, the book deal was coming out, I was going all over the world, and I said, are you okay with mum talking about my journey? Because my kids have always known what's appropriate for their age. So yeah. my youngest at five knew, so most adults are lovely, some aren't, my parents yeah. weren't, so I lived with others. You know, my And I love that. Funny, knows it all. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not carrying someone else's shame, keeping secrets, no. that's ridiculous. But I, might, my, I said to my son, is it all right, me doing this? Because if it isn't, then we will talk about that and I won't do it. And he's 12 years old. He yeah. said to me, I don't think it matters what happened when you were a child. I think what matters is what happened next. And that's why you should talk about it because wow. people need to know there's a next. And I mean, we built our entire company on that, meeting people where they are and people knowing there's a next. And for me, it's that drive. I am driven by dissatisfaction. This isn't some altruistic, oh, let's all be happy and earth. Yeah. No, I'm dissatisfied that people settle with lies and crap and, and yeah. someone else's story about who they are and who they could be. The five people that knew who they were made a difference and made, opened doors for me to be yeah. who I was. 95% of the teachers, I always think about 100 teachers, five that helped, five that were okay, yeah. but were tired and knackered and bitter and twisted and exhausted and living in their own limited garden of possibility exactly. of this is as good as it gets. It's like you don't know what you don't know, do you? Yeah, no. I can't I can't live like that. So I always had a real strong sense of injustice. Like I knew what was happening wasn't right, 
but I, you know, I disclosed four times. Nobody believed me. I, I asked questions. It was, I knew it wasn't right. I just didn't know how to Deal find with someone else and talk about it with them. I yeah. didn't have the words. And it was when I was 16, my stepdad got arrested and actually got put in prison for abusing mm -hmm. me. I, I remember speaking to the police and the police officer said, well, it's your word against his love. The only way he'll go to trial is if he confesses. And then he did confess when they arrested oh, really? him. really? amazingly and yeah. the police man phoned me back and said he said he's confessed I said I don't believe it and he said why were you making it up I'm like even oh. in the police, evidence and data you've still got such strong confirmation so I have to write my own story I cannot rely on anyone else no. to write that story for me and I think I wrote a book when I was eight called The Truth According to Me I wrote it when I was in the cellar in my head and it's just this I will not let anyone else write the story of me yeah. that's my job I think that's what it is I think it's really empowering. And as more and more people now are talking about their own mental health problems, their, me their medical problems, it's saying mm. this happens, this is normal. Mm, yeah. It's getting those stories out there. But it sounds like some teachers had a huge impact on your life. Mm. And yeah. I've spent a lot of my professional life teaching medical students and doctors, and it's yeah. not always easy. You get days where you're having a really bad day and days where they just piss you off. But you get <laughs> such a sense of pride when they get it. When someone does their first yeah. appendectomy or they get a diagnosis right, it's almost like you've given them a baby set of wings and yeah. helped them to fly. What kind of drew you into teaching? Was it kind of wanting to give back and help other children like you? No. <laughs> well, there we I, go. I don't really want people to have the idea that I'm some ultra kind. I mean, I am no. kind. That's by choice. I, the idea of me being a teacher was ridiculous. You know, when you talk Why? about, because people like, my theme tune was people like me don't do things like that because I'm not good enough. Okay. That was right. the bridge. I'm not good enough was yeah. the bridge. So the idea that someone like me would do anything like that, you know, I knew what people like me did and they didn't, they didn't go into okay. teaching. You know, they got pregnant when they were 12, got a house on I the got a council house, and yeah. And then got beaten up and, you know, yeah. did drugs a lot. So I, I knew what my future was, but it was... <laughs> it was, our, we had this, this Mrs. Cook, she used to make us say who we were going to be when we grew up, not not what we were going to do, who we were going to be. Oh, I like that. Yeah, and I remember it being my turn. Actually, one kid, Derek, he said, I'm going to be a daddy. And we're like, idiot, <laughs> she means jobs. But he did go on, Liz, to have several children with several different Aww. women. So well, dreams come true. <laughs> they do. Come <laughs> on, Derek. <laughs> but, uh, but mine was, I want to be, uh, when, who do you want to be? I'm like, I want to be just like you. I wanted Aww. to be someone else. I spent my entire life wanting to be someone else. And I wanted to be someone who was comfortable with themselves and who truly enjoyed being with other people. And that was not me. Those two things, that was not me. Yeah. So, a form of escapism in a way? No, no. I think no. I, I felt like I was living a nine-carat plastic world at home. I, I chose to believe that my experience at school with good adults was the reality and that my experience yeah. at home was some kind of sordid nightmare that I couldn't wake up from. That yeah. That's how I like navigated it. So, and I classified adults as well into category one, two, and three. One, okay. I'm and, nervous now. No, no, no. And I, I have to stop myself because you know when you grow up with someone, if you grow up bullied or with an abuser or yeah. in a doctor, you know you learn to read body language. You think yeah. you're a bit psychic, but you can just read people really well. You get a vibe. You get a vibe. So I was doing that. And category one were great adults. They loved you. They were genuine. You're category one. You can tell by the way that you're connecting and being Aww. professionally vulnerable and personally authentic. Easy. Category two like you. They're not going to hurt you, but you're a bit yeah. of a burden. They haven't really got time. They've got other stuff yeah. to do. Category three are either dangerous or idiots or dangerous idiots, and they should be avoided at all cost. But I lived with category three yeah. and met category one. So I every time I was in foster care, every time I went to a new family, every time I was started at a new setting, I just laid that down and chose. It's a choice, isn't it? Like I wanted to be a teacher. I, I, I did. I wanted because it was the highest form of human, and it still is. It, oh, definitely. I, I, you know, it's, there's something amazing about leaving that like gift in yeah. other people but all, more than that I just didn't want to having been victimized I didn't want to live life as a victim yeah like victim would be lovely place to go on holiday but you can't live there no but I love what you said about almost starting again every time you change setting and I think it's hard to get rid of friends who you don't like anymore but it's like life is too short to spend time with people who don't love you yeah and you can let them go and you can move on and as life changes your friendships might change and that's okay Mm. it's hard though isn't it oh it's really really hard to let friendships go that guilt but actually 
if they're giving you more pain than joy, sometimes you do have to put yourself first. But so, do you find that, you know that book I used to read to my kids, I wrote to the zoo to send, dear zoo, I wrote to the zoo to send yes. me a pet. They sent me. I always think that, like, I wrote to the zoo to send me a pet, they sent me a macaque. And some people would get a macaque in the house, it would tear the, it would just rip the house to shreds, eat everything, poo everywhere. Yeah. And they would rather live with the macaque than put it in a box and send it back. Because yeah. the effort required. And I, I feel like that. I feel like I've been there where I've chosen chaos. I've chosen chaos. Because it, it's too hard to deal with the stuff in your head. It's, it's easy impossible. to live with the chaos you expect yeah. than to say, right, a lot needs to change. Yeah. And and so I've tried being depressed. I've tried being suicidal. I've tried being miserable. They all suck. They do suck. What I do now is I choose when I wake up in the morning, I choose this. And sometimes yeah. I don't choose it till half 11 because, you know, yeah. I'm a human. But I, yeah. I choose this way of being. But talking about change... I think now's a good time to bring up, and you'll probably hate me for doing this, and the thing that you probably hate being famous for, which you know what I'm going to say. <laughs> How did you go from being a teacher to being on The Apprentice 10 years ago? What made you apply? Look, look, I have a hobby, right? Every 20 years, I apply to yeah. one reality TV show and I get on. Oh, really? Yeah, I do. It's a hobby. It's a hobby. I love so when this. I was 20, I went on blind date. No. no I applied to go on The Krypton Factor. But I couldn't fill in the application form. So, yeah, so I went on Friday. And I was a picker and I picked number two from Leeds. And we went uh -huh. on a date. And he climbed out of a toilet window to go to McDonald's, left me in a restaurant. So it was nice. on the best blind date every year for the next nine years in the worst date category. <laughs> so There's a recurring theme here. <laughs> yeah. So bang on brand with my terrible taste in men. So 20 years yeah. later, I'm like, it takes 20 years to get over it. So 20 years later, I'm like, I need a show that's got gravitas. And also, I'm a teacher now. I'm married. I've got three kids. I'm like, I've got this great idea for um, literacy being a bit like a mushy monster game. I mean, this exists now, which is fantastic. Yeah. But it, I remember when I was in foster care, you'd go to different places and everything about you, your story would be left somewhere else. And because you were a child, it was hard to advocate for yourself and say, no, look, I'm really good at my, yeah. put me in the top set. So you had to keep reinventing who you were. And I wanted to be me. I wanted to be the true me. And I was frustrated in teaching with children coming different schools and you had no information on them. So it was like a record of who they were and what they could do and it could go home to school. I thought, oh, I'll, I'll invent this. So I applied for The Apprentice, which, you know, looks really easy when you're sat on the sofa eating Haribo, yes. going, these people are very stupid. They shouldn't be allowed. <laughs> <laughs> but when you're one of the very stupid people... <laughs> yes, in your oh. high heels, cluttering down the high street, oh. you're going, why don't they wear trainers and sensible clothing? My show, my show was the year that The Apprentice went really glamorous. It was all Louboutins and right. hair extensions. Apart from me, I'm dressed yeah. all in black, looking like I'm ready for a funeral on the, in the beginning bit. But anyway, so I go on the show... And Alan shouldn't we go in and Lord Sugar says, who's going to be team leader? And I say, I am. Never on week one. Never on week one. Like, yeah, everyone's like, haven't you seen the show? I'm like, yeah, you eat, if you win, you're a hero. But obviously yeah. I, I lost and I was fired in the first week, bringing Ooh. nationwide shame to educators everywhere. You're welcome. And when people say to me, why do you keep doing this? Like, what's wrong with you? Or what, you know, what are you going to do next is the first one. And if I did yeah. a plan date at 20 and apprentice at 40, I'm 50 now, but in 10 years' time, I will be on Love Island. It's happening. Oh, I was about to say it's that. It's, look, or RuPaul's Drag Race. I don't know which one. Yeah, that would be amazing. Did you have to learn to speak in management cliches and give 110%? <laughs> <laughs> no. Oh, I just make it up as I go along with somebody else. Like, and Marmite, they either like me or they won't. Yeah. But yeah, and the other thing they ask is, why do you keep doing it? And it's like, why not? Imagine if you were living with nothing to fear and nothing to lose. Yeah. And nothing to prove. That's how I live. Like, yeah. I'm genuinely not scared because I have failed so many times. I am an artist. I'm a failure artist. So I know how to reframe. I know how to pivot. Yeah. And, and the worst thing that happens to me is when things go right the first time and I miss out on an opportunity to exactly. reframe and embed ambitious yeah. resilience. And Do you know what I mean? So I'm not saying everyone should go and apply for reality TV shows, although it's very easy to get on a rash. Well, I have applied yeah. for the Sewing Bee and the Bake Off. And oh, I got to the second you? round of auditions, but I've never got any further. And I think I don't want to be that doctor oh. crying on the floor looking at their bread or breaking a zip. I'd like to send me back. I'm probably sorry. You know, Nadia from Bake Off, Liz, she yes. lives down the road. I get confused for her. Like, it's happened four times. Because you're both brown ladies. Oh, so we're, and we got two eyes and boobs. So clearly we're identical. Yes. I mean, she, she wears a head covering. It's like, <laughs> but the last time someone thought I was her, they said, oh my God, you were on reality TV. And I was like, yeah. 
you won Bake Off. And I went, yes, I did. Oh, <laughs> own it. It just makes a nice change from, no, I was fired from The Apprentice. And it makes them feel more comfortable, doesn't it? Then, oh God, I made a huge mistake. I've signed loads of her books for her. So, you know. Love it. <laughs> You said at the beginning, you are a resilience ninja. How do I become one? (laughs) Well, I've got T-shirts. I sell T-shirts. Excellent. This, this, again, I talk a lot about this, uh, the hula hoop of choice. Okay. That it is choice. Like, I feel like I hate the fact that choice is the main factor. I have to say this carefully. When I was working in prisons, I was speaking to some prisoners and they were sharing their story and I was sharing mine. And the main difference because we're all humans. I'm, I mean, I'm scared. I'm scared the first time and I'm try, I'm slapping myself in my head thinking, get a grip, Jazz, find something in common. And I'm looking at these guys thinking, I have nothing in common with you guys. But then I realised I haven't got a gun on my neck. I haven't got gold teeth. I'm not this, this Russian guy. I was square. Yeah. He was just one muscle. But we're all, we're all human. We all burp. We all fart. We all worry. We all want something better for someone else than we had for ourselves. And and so we kind of start talking. I said, and they, they had genuinely awful stories, you know, expelled from school and then... They almost became what you might have become. Yeah, yeah. It's not, it's not rocket science. It's literally a, it's, it's a, it's a step-by-step roadmap. That's what it is. Yeah. And I said, the thing about this is, after what's happened to you, you're perfectly within your right to be like bitter, twisted, angry. And the Russian guy went, but? And I was like, oh no, there's no but. Like, full stop. You are perfectly within your rights to be bitter, twisted, and angry, full stop. Yeah. There is no but, but there is an and. And oh. you could choose another way of being. You could. And, and yeah. what I described was like, you know, if you hold a hula hoop, it's like really close to you. Now, I was thinking crisp, but you mean one that you spin around your waist, don't you? A big hula hoop. A big hula hoop. <laughs> if you hold that close to you and you're like accidental, if you just carry it around all day, at some point your head's going to go through it. That's the easy choice that everyone expects. It feels like there's no other way but it is a choice. We just don't see the edges of the hula hoop. If you push that hula hoop away, and that's literally all you have to do, push it away. You see all these mini hula hoop, these crisps on the hula hoop, and they are also choices. But that's where you need someone else to shine a light on it so that you can see them. You need someone else to grease you up like the tiger in Madagascar 3. I watched that last night. So you can get through them. With that support, you can make the harder choices. So there are choices. It's just more difficult. For me... I have failed so many times. I have given up so many times. Like the last time I wanted to just die was in my first year of university when I had nowhere to live in the holidays. And I'm like, there's no point. I've worked so hard and now I'm homeless with nowhere to go. I can't tell anyone at uni because I'm ashamed. I cannot yeah. do this for another four years. So I was like, I just, I've had enough. I give up. I'm not worth it. Let's just, I agree, let's go. And I remember yeah. when I didn't die and I remember really clearly saying out loud, if I'm going to be on this planet, there's going to be some effing changes around here. And it was like, I felt like I compromised myself. I was flat Stanley. I couldn't do any more. So if I'm going to take up space, everyone else is going to have to move up because I can no longer turn the volume down on who I am. I, there's, I, I have been as quiet as possible. It's still not good Like the critical mass of shit to be dumped on your head. It's, it's like, what do you want from me? I'm here, yeah. you know? I, I'm sorry I'm alive, but I can't do anything about it. So the resilience came from not a stiff upper lip, not bravery even. It's the time between falling on the floor and getting back up again. That's yeah. it. For me, that used to be years. Yeah, years. And then it would be months. I got it down to weeks, days, hours. I can do it in minutes and I'm going for seconds. It's that how quick, how long it takes you to get back yeah. to the truth about who you are, not what your brain thinks, your brain's a liar, but the actual yeah. evidence and data from people you know and love and trust, the truth about who you are, how long it takes you to get back to that. So what I've done is exercised pivoting and coming back to that. And, 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 and I've been doing it since I was a kid. Like, I'm faced with this. You're hopeless, you're worthless, you're cheap, you're dirty, you're guilty, you're worthless, and you're being beaten up, you're lying on the ground, you're being kicked, and I'm... All I can think of, no, this isn't right. Because it's easier to give in. It's easier to go, yeah. I am worth nothing. This is right. But I'm like, it's not right. I don't have any other answers. I just have a bag full of questions. But I yeah. keep asking them. It doesn't happen overnight. But it's, it happens with the smallest, tiniest next step of yeah. a different way of being. But people, you cannot do I I don't know how anyone does this on their own. I don't know how yeah. people do this on their own. I've kind of been there several times, you know, cancer twice, suicidal twice. Mm. I think a lot of my listeners like me will have been through their own version of hell. Yeah. And especially with a medical diagnosis, you can feel incredibly alone because yeah. no one else has had that cancer experience. They don't understand what's going through your head. You can feel lost or broken or guilty. Mm. God, the guilt I felt that 
I was still alive when people were dying of cancer. And I think when you're going through that by yourself, because no one understands, how can you kickstart your life and try to pivot and make something good come out of it? Yeah. When you got cancer the second time. Yeah. Like, did you feel like, you know, that you fought it before? So you've got, yeah. there's, there's capacity for another disaster. But did you feel that you had capacity for another comeback? Or did you go into it the second time thinking, you know, like when you have a baby, yeah, yeah. And you have another one, and you think, I know what I'm doing, but you didn't have a toddler the first time. Yeah, it, no, people say that. I think for me, because I was a breast surgeon, I knew that if it came back locally, it was much more likely to come back properly again, metastatic. Right, okay. So my risk of dying from breast cancer was suddenly much, much higher. Right, right. And it was that sense of what's the point? Yeah. The average life yeah. expectancy is three years, so I'm not going to plan anything beyond three years. I can't. But you kind of have to carry on. You get the treatment. The problem for me was dealing with the permanent side effects, the chronic yes. pain, yeah. the menopausal symptoms, a change of image. And how do you suddenly accept I am a different person mentally and physically in this body, yeah. but there is still life to be had. And to somehow find a way to say, OK, I'm going to put on makeup for the first time in a year and I'm going to look after myself. But it's it's the thoughts in your head that come in. And I think one of the dangers of social media is you can find whatever it is you're looking for. Oh, yeah. <laughs> And it's, it is pure luck whether you, so I met with a couple of doctors having cancer at the same time as me and we had our own tribe and we could talk about how shit chemo was. We carried mm. each other through. If I hadn't have found them, yes. I'd have gone through a year of treatment completely alone and goodness yeah. knows how my life might have turned out. Mm. Yeah, social media is, is a double-edged sword. What we tend to do is compare our backstage with everyone else's front stage and then find ourselves lacking, lack comparisonitis. Yeah. So no. we other ourselves in that sense. So you finding people, and I, I'm convinced of this, my company is called Human First, and it's about the central tenant is meeting people where they are because yeah. connection is the antidote to depression, to everything, to being isolated. And I, I talk a lot about a human revolution because we've okay. had an industrial revolution. That went well. We've yeah. had, you know, a technical revolution. We're in the middle of a digital revolution spotted dick ai generated recipe anybody <laughs> oh, but God, don't. i think a human revolution where we actually are professionally vulnerable and personally authentic and stand in our own integrity i am living for this because that was my route to like yeah. success to being fully alive i always feel like there's stages and i used to go up and down these but suffering is the first stage you just heads down surviving people say i'm surviving that means breathing <laughs> surviving is it's, it's a bit of a low bar you know <laughs> very low bar but for some people that is the first step well, one time you've got to be there that's not a goal that's a step no. along the way because the next stage is thriving where we all feel really excited to get but beyond that there's another stage being truly alive yeah. and beyond that there's another stage driving change now the stages you don't do all the stages in everything but for me it's like suffering surviving Thriving's a bare minimum and thriving means nothing to me unless I'm truly alive and driving change. So it's moving up and down that. And I know when I've hit times and when I'm scared, I'm still, I still like trust is a big thing for me that I'm still working yeah. on. I've processed yeah. so much. The big stuff feels really, well, it doesn't feel easy. It took years, but I've processed that in, in therapy. And now I'm, I'm doing a master's in positive psychology myself. So I've, I've done all that kind of training and coaching. But the tiniest things can just knock the wind out of you. Yeah. Like the colour of a dress, the picture on a screen can just totally pull you back into this point of hopelessness. Like for me, it's knowing that children are in the position I was in today on my yeah. street. If I dwell there and, and take my focus off the hopers, yeah, I, I can't, I'm redundant. I can't do anything. Yeah. So that's why I'm really interested in you because I know for me, the kind of always knowing things could go wrong again, but not knowing if I could overcome again it was a, a scary place to be. But you, you said it yourself. You, I don't think it's that you have to go on. I think you get to go on. It's like yes. you get to do it. You don't have to do it. You don't have to do anything, but you get to. Yeah. And I think for me, I used to fret about the numbers and my odds of it coming back and what's going to happen. Mm. And actually, we all die. Yeah. And I either die of breast cancer or I don't. And it's out of my control. Mm. I can choose to exercise and live healthily and do this, but everything else is out of my control. So what yeah. am I going to do with the rest of my days? Now I'm no longer a surgeon. I've lost my identity. I lost my purpose. I couldn't operate. Mm. What am I going to do? How can I still help people? And it was just communications and connections and just finding yeah. a way forward. Mm. And for me, it was letting people help me. I'm so yeah. blooming independent. 
<laughs> don't show me how to do it. Let me do it myself. And to actually let people help yeah. me and look after me and accept I'm not a Wonder Woman. Yeah. And I think that's another thing about social media. We compare ourselves to the filtered aspects of people's best lives. Mm, yeah. And I realized if I'm there saying, oh, I'm doing this and I did a half Iron Man and I've written a book and I've got a podcast, I've got a hater. She's a bloody superwoman. I can never be <laughs> like her. And actually the moments when you say, I was really depressed or mm. I look like this and actually showing them that you are human, I think it's really important so people know we are just normal people. When you show yourself... When you show up as your full fat self, it's a currency that buys loyalty and increases yeah. aspiration in a way that nothing else can. But I, d I don't think it's wrong to say, oh, I've got a podcast. I'm just, I, I literally, I do an activity with people. Where I'm like, talk about yourself for 15 seconds. Just talk about the good stuff and listen to, yeah. especially women going, well, you know, you know, I'm a good mum. Well, hopefully, you know, I'm all right as a partner. Well, you know, sometimes I'm like, just to, mine is I'm a phenomenal human female. I meet people where they are. I bring out the best I, because I know that I know yeah. that. So that's important. And also, like you said, I didn't wake up like this. I mean, I wake up like this because this is what my hair yeah. looks like. And I don't wear makeup, so I literally woke up like this. But I, it's a choice. You have to opt into it. And it's a yeah. tiny habit all the time. So that when, like everyone thought they were all resilient and then COVID hit and we realised how unresilient some businesses yeah. were and some families were. Exactly. We didn't have it there. It's in that challenge that we realise it. And I feel like I'm talking about this but like at the minute, I've been told I've got to have, let me get the right word, hysteroscopy. I keep saying hysteroscopy. Yes. hysteroscopy. Um, and so and my default setting all the time with anything medical is I'm going to die. And when I did, when I had pneumonia at about 40, for my 40th birthday, I remember lying in the hospital. I was like all hooked up to all this stuff. I had a mask on. I couldn't lift my hands. I couldn't talk. Yeah. And I remember falling to sleep thinking, I don't know if I'm going to wake up. And in the moment where I actually could have, like, really, you know, was yeah. quite close to dying, I said goodbye to Ed, my husband, and I thought, well, if I die, Ed knows I love him, the kids know I love them, and I've got great friends and family. Okay, can't do anything else. And then I went yeah. to sleep. Now, I did wake up the next day, but my biggest fear is still, I get you need a hysterectomy. I'm like, oh, my God, am I going to die? It's like, why do I jump to that? Why do I cut out all this stuff here, <laughs> just jump to? It's that fear, you know, and not letting fear drive the bus. That is yeah. the thing that I aim for all the time because it's always going to go wrong. There's not an if, yeah. what if. It's always going to be when. And I and think it, it's you know. acknowledging you have the fear, like saying, well, what are you actually scared of? You might die. Yeah. Well, yes, yeah. you might die. Can't do anything about that. Yeah. Move on. And you're going to die with an unfinished to-do list. That's what scares me the most. <laughs> you, oh, God, there's always, the list never ends. There's always, I love writing a list of the things I need to do and then, oh, I love a list. But what's <laughs> Having cancer made me realise that it's my family and friends that are important. I don't need all this shit behind yeah. me. And yeah. I love that you said the most important thing when you thought you were dying is that your family knew you loved them. Yeah, yeah. And it kind of breaks it right down to, we are lucky to have that support. There are many people who don't, but it really mm. is the simple things. But I want to talk about owning your worth. Yeah. Because what you were talking about, you know, women saying, oh, I think I'm a good mum. Right back at medical school, whenever a consultant would ask us a question, the girls would always say, well, it could be and it might be and I'm not sure. And yeah. some rubby bloke would say, it is this. Wrong. Yeah. But because he was confident, yeah. the consultant believed him. And I'm terrible at like owning my worth. We are very bad, I think, as a, a female sex at blowing mm. our own trumpet, demanding to be paid what we think we should, talking about money, saying, how can you help my listeners think, right, own your worth. Yeah. This is what you need to do. This is how you can grow and actually get paid or be valued for what you can really offer. I think the first thing is realising you're not unique or special because we think in that situation that you were talking about, we're like, oh, I don't want to say, what if I look stupid? What if I get it wrong? That is every single person around you is thinking the same thing. You're not special in thinking that. It's literally nothing about you. And the human condition is people going, uh, it's the way people react to it. Now, you could argue that guys are... You know, certainly my generation, Generation X, you, you go out when you're a teenager, the guys go and chat a girl up. It doesn't go right. You just go on to the next one. Yeah. The girls have to respond to being chatted up slash harassed. So in a way, like my brothers learned, you just keep going, just keep going, just yeah. keep going. Whereas I learned you're in defend mode. Or you pretty yourself up and get your boobs out in the hope that someone will pick you. And why didn't they pick me? I've got to do this yeah. next time. Well, I, yeah. I, I kind of decided that would never happen anyway. So that relieved me from a lot of that. But yeah, for me, I would approach people because I'm like, no, I'm writing my own story. But, yeah. but again, driven by dissatisfaction. The owning your worth thing, there's something I ask people to do sometimes when I'm doing keynotes. And I ask them to get their phones out. <laughs> like if you're doing something on wellbeing, ask them to get their phone out, find someone they know and trust and send them a text 
saying, what one thing do you wish I would do to improve my well-being? And we talk about actually going with fact over feelings, right? Because my, my feelings are very strong. Like I do an activity where I get them to face each other and say something nice about your partner's face. And, and I see people as someone's going, you know, you've got really friendly eyes. And you see people go, oh, 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 oh. Don't look at me. Yeah, it's like, I like your top. Oh, it's only Primark. It's like, all right. Yeah, but I hate it when women do that. Say, thank you. I like this top too. Eye contact, smile. Thank you. That's what we practice. Accept a compliment. But everybody feels uncomfortable in a place where they've got to put themselves forward. You wouldn't be human if you didn't. Now, for the guys that shout the answer out, they have rehearsed and gotten better at going, shortening the time between the nervousness and the result and going, yeah, it's this. So I'm like, I used to pretend I had an invisible friend called Tarquin when I was 18, not even a child. And Tarquin went to Eton and was white and male. He had like this tuft of blonde hair. And Tarquin was beyond confident. He was entitled, but it was it was the quiet. Yeah, if you needed a volunteer, Tarquin would go, yeah, I'll do it. <laughs> because Tarquin couldn't consider the possibility that he wouldn't be able to do Love it. So I'm like, right, what would Tarquin do? And it's this idea of when you feel like I'm not good enough, people like me don't do things like that, know that you did not write those songs. They are the songs that exist in the human condition and everyone is thinking and feeling it. What you get to do is choose, do you want to go along with the status quo of self-doubt? Do you want to yeah. do that? Because that the choice is yours. Or do you want to say... You know what? And I, I do this. I'll stand in front of a room of 500 people and go, OK, put your hand up if you're a success and just look at the room. And it's I, it's shoddy. If you're in America, everyone gets on the table. Oh, yes, yes, yeah. But in the UK, people are like, oh, I don't know, Sandra. Yeah. I, I think you are. You are. And I'm like, if you have found a way of surviving 100% of your shittiest days, if you cannot attribute that as being a success, you yeah. found me at the right time. But what we've got to do is start reframing and rebranding failure in a way that doesn't, it's not a full stop. It's not even a semicolon. It's no, you have to fail to learn and to grow. You're supposed to fa- aim for epic failure. So you can, you can do it and move on past it and grow. Definitely, It's a hard journey, but it starts with a decision to do it. And then asking other people, what is the truth about me? Who am I? People you know and trust. Like I had a mate called Ben who was in a, an accident and lost, he lost his memory and lost all of his sense of self. And his friends used to come and visit him and they'd play heavy metal music and talk about running because that's what he loved. Yeah. And they said, oh, you know, when you used to run, you loved this. And he'd go, did I? And so at one point, he did, imagine losing your identity at the point you don't know yeah. who you are. At one point he said, I decided to be like the Ben my friends knew. So I started listening to rock music. I started thinking about running. And that is how I got better, by Aww. being like Ben. Isn't that powerful? So I'm it's like, amazing. I'm going to be the person that other people, people who see me and go, oh, you're amazing at this. I'm like, what if that's true? What if I live as if what they think about me is actually the truth? And then it's totally different to living to what I believe. Which yes, is- which is very different. So my husband would say that's fishing for compliments, but I'm going to say Jazz has told me. Fishing for compliments? No, it's rebranding the liar that lives in your head. <laughs> Love this. There's a difference between neediness and basic human needs. We need to yeah. belong, and that means we need community. And that means we need to rely on people who know us well enough. So when our amygdala is going, you're fat, you're ugly, you look old, yeah. get out. Other people are going, well, the fact is you are a resource to people and because of you, I am who I am. So whatever you feel, fact is going to take precedence all the time. So, yeah, I suppose it could be fishing for compliments, but I prefer to see it as the reason I'm phenomenal. That's I'm going to have words with my husband. Tell me how amazing I am every day. But right now, yeah. I've, I've been told to say two words to you. Oh. Power gran. <laughs> So where did you get that from? <laughs> Secret sources. Come on, I can't reveal my sources. <laughs> Sorry, Power listeners. Gran. Yes. <laughs> this is my nan. Powerful nan. My nan, right, had, she looked like Les Dawson in drag. She had huge bosoms with her glasses on a chain. She was arms folded all the time, mm, like this, very formidable. People would come to the back of our fence when I lived with her and they'd discuss well, mainly they'd, she'd watch the news and go, hang him, hang him. She was very judgmental, <laughs> very biased, <laughs> quite a little bit racist, even though she had a brown granddaughter. You're really no, selling her. But this yeah. woman, she was, as well as being kind and compassionate and lovely, you know, she took me in and stuff. She stood for integrity. She would call a spade a spade in a way that if you've grown up working class, you can only ever love. 
And the horrible thing about being working class at birth and becoming middle class and having kids that eat couscous and things like that is that you leave behind a community. Yeah. To move forward, you have to say goodbye to people. My nan was someone who you couldn't say goodbye to because she lives... Like, my daughter will say things that she said even though my nan died before my daughter was born. So clearly it's coming through yeah. me. She had this kind of wisdom and stoic nature. And it was she was very, like, wartime nan. So when she took me in, it's like, right, there's a bed, there's some food. You are looked after. There was no... Like, no need for connection or love or anything like that. But humour, humour was where we met. My nan was so full of wisdom. And all of the stuff I talk about has come from her or EastEnders, really. <laughs> They're the two sources. She was just someone who didn't take any rubbish. And she was a woman during the 40s and 50s. Well, she was a woman her whole life. But, you know, yeah. World War II. She, she lived got... in that time. Yeah. What can you imagine? She lived with my granddad. They got married. He lied about his age. Then he went off to war, came back. They got married. Then he left two weeks later. She didn't see him for four years. Came back a different oh, man. Different I man can't broken. imagine. Yeah. And she has to carry on with the household and running home. everything, hoping they'll come home. You can't imagine, can you? My mum had like four, six kids, different dads. She just kept taking them in and taking care of them until she couldn't do it anymore. And wow. we lived in a brothel and she would come and visit us. She wouldn't come in. Standards, she'd say. Standards! <laughs> so she wouldn't come in. But she'd pull up in the car and pass the soap out the window. And there was this one time when she realised we weren't in school. We'd, we'd gone and we just, we were feral, so they didn't enrol us in school. Yeah. And my nan, I've never seen this. She got out of the car and she had a handbag, little handle, triangle handbag. She had a handbag. She marched into the brothel. I don't know what was said. I heard a lot of shouting, but we were enrolled <laughs> in school the next day. <laughs> it was just like, and I'm like, you do not mess with her. You do not. You know. I'm like, picturing the children's TV series now of Power Grand. Yeah, that's her. You, you know Happy Valley? She is yes. the, she's Catherine in Happy Valley. Oh, is she? She's Catherine. <laughs> she's totally that. Got you. Just wow. badass grandma. <laughs> yeah, like we all need one. Yeah, yeah. And I, I collect brothers as well. I collect brothers because I'm good at being a sister. My brother, closest to me in age, took a heroin overdose and died. And we had the same story, but I had people standing with me, doing withness, and he only had people doing things to or for him. There's yeah. a difference. So I feel especially broken when I hear stories of men going through adversity in a place where it's not cool still for you no. to say, you know what, when you put a rat in a cage and you poke it with a stick, when you let it out, it's probably going to bite you. I'm a rat. Yeah. I've been poked. I feel like biting and I actually want to not bite. I need some help with this. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, it's still not okay, easy, cool. No, and I think that. the whole, you know, toxic masculinity they I think men find it much harder to often make connections and to share what they're really really feeling and I think as women we need men to help empower us just as yeah. much as we need women I think definitely just, just be nice to everybody really well only the, the tight one adults obviously the, well no no but oh no that's interesting really. oh, okay for me if you're going to meet people where they are that's everyone you don't get yeah. to choose whether you like or not. So when Philip Hammond was on the front page of some paper going, there's no poverty in London, I live and work in London, I don't see poverty, you're like, well, first of all, you, you live in Mayfair and work in Westminster, so you're not going to see a lot of poverty. But no. lots of people were like shouting, and this happens today, someone says something and then everyone shouts, but they're shouting at each other and disagreeing and polarising each other, they're only hanging around with people like us who think and feel the same as us. That's not. I want change more than I want to be right. I want to be right yeah. a lot, ask my husband but I want change more. And that means I have to inconvenience myself and not hang around with people who are brown Beyonce lookalikes because I kind of got yeah. that covered. Oh, you've got that covered. Be with people who are different. That's the whole point. If you had one tip to help anyone listening who is struggling and they think they're, they're in a tough place, they don't know how to start moving forward and getting that resilience, is there one little tip you could give them to help them start on the journey? I hate the journey word. I'm sorry I said it. Yeah, but... No, no, no. It's journey. It's the word, though, isn't it? To start pivoting. There's an image that comes up of there's always a way through. There is always a way through. And I haven't experienced everything. And without getting into disadvantaged Olympics, there are people in much worse situations than me. There are people right now listening to this saying, I have no way of seeing a way through. It is not possible for me to move forward from here. And I would say to you that what you know is possible 
is limited to your experience, your reading, your your life, your thoughts, your feelings, and you are not the gold standard of human. There are other people with different experiences who have survived bigger and stronger and uglier things than you are in right now and can give you a roadmap. You just have to be prepared to consider the possibility that that might be true. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to take steps. You don't have to do the journey on your own, but you need to be open to considering the possibility that you don't have all the answers. Love that. And I think if I'd had that, my journey to recovery and sobriety would have been easier and quicker. And maybe listening, it's so painful to stay where you are that you have to change. Thinking what life might be like if you don't do anything. Well, you, I, I, I honestly feel though, Liz, that, for some people, and for me included, there was there's been lots of times when I've chosen like it's just easier. Let me just lie down here on my yeah. face in the soil and wait to die. It's easier. And I've been there a month ago, my mum's funeral. You just you can't. Yeah. There's no point. You Why? lose everything. What is the point? Just, just stop now. Yeah. And and mum's funeral and the year of firsts after that. Every yeah. time there's a birthday or Easter or Christmas, it's gonna or be you fun. Find, you know, and it's like yeah. it, grief is like it's like being in an ocean and there's no blooming Leonardo DiCaprio hanging to a board to keep you company. It's, it's just these waves and, and then it's tiring and then it's boring and then it's exhausting. And, and yeah. every single one of us, we may have different stories, but we know what fear is. We know what guilt is. We know what grief is. We know what hurt is. And we also know there is a way through. Yeah. And I, I hate that there is. I wish the answer was, yeah, give it up, son. You'll never be a walker. I wish that was the answer. Give it up. Just lie down. Give up. But I, my it's experience not. myself and everything I've read has told me, shit, there is a way through. <laughs> and yeah. it's, that's, it's almost shit. There is a way through. It's not. Yay. There's a way through. Because actually, like, if there wasn't, life would be easier. It just wouldn't be better. You, you can't spend all day under the duvet eating biscuits in bed watching Netflix. You could do it for a while, but you're gonna. It's gonna make you worse. It's not. A, it's a holiday strategy. It's not a life strategy. <laughs> Love that. Listening to Beyonce, obviously. Favorite Beyonce song. Uh, ring on it. Absolutely. Oh, If nice. you like it, then you should have put a ring on it. I think that's my lifetime anthem. <laughs> no, I saw you've got a book coming out next January, haven't you? Yes. Well, I've got two. So this one, oh, okay. I've written one for educators. And this was really kind of looking at the tiny acts of compassion, tiny things that these five teachers did while I was going from four through to 25. The tiny things that they did that made it possible for me to pick myself up and keep going. So that's called Because of You this is me because genuinely I should be dead and I'm not. And it's because of, it's because of people like you. It is because of yeah. people like you. This is what your success looks like. So that's for them. And then there's the human revolution, which is more of a book for everyone, not educators about this ability to be who we were designed to be instead of having to play a role that we didn't sign up for, but we find ourselves second cactus from the left, you know, yeah. and how that looks at life and in work, in business, in work yeah. and in life. I'll be looking out for both of those. Now, before I let you go, because I could talk to you for hours and hours, we have a podcast, Jar of Joy. Oh, I started this during chemo when I found out my cancer had come back, it had grown. What was the point? It was Christmas. And yeah. I thought, I don't like mindfulness stuff, but if something good happens, I'm going to put it in the jar. Like <gasps> finding a fiver down the back of the sofa or a bird singing. And it's not every day, but we have one for the podcast. And these are the entries you've had so far. Oh. It's your turn to fill it. So I want to know something that's made you smile in the last week. In the last week. And we'll put it in the jar. My, so I foster this medical detection dog who can smell diabetes and COVID oh. and stuff. I don't know. He's really clever. But I'm, I'm his foster mum. So I took him out for a walk on the lake, which has been frozen for two weeks. And every time we go there, every day, he runs up to the edge. He's like, oh, and he's desperate. You know, dogs just want to live yes. another yeah. nap. I, and so he's desperate and he can't go in. And the, we went yesterday and there was finally a tiny bit that was not frozen. The swans were there. The books were there. Everyone was trying to, you know, be him on bit. Um, and Archie just ran to the edge, saw the water, reversed and then launched himself <laughs> And I pissed myself laughing. I literally was on the floor like, oh boy, I know how long. <laughs> Mom, it's water. That is the, the picture of joy. It was just that he literally reversed. So, and then when yeah. he jumped, he goes, Whoo! and he's got no idea if he's going to land on the ice or on a duck. He didn't care. He just, he just went for it. And I'm like, that is who I want to be when I grow up. That's who I want to be. That's where a I'm flying heading. dog. Oh, uh, I love yeah. that. That's what made me laugh. <laughs> that is definitely going in the jar of joy. Oh. 
<laughs> Thank you so much for talking to me today. We'll put where to find you and all about you in the show notes because it's boring when people read them at the end of a podcast. But thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with the listeners today, Jazz. Thank you for having me on and for letting me be in your orbit. You, you've, I feel like I've received more than I've given. And I give a lot, but I feel like I've received more. So thank you. And that brings us to the end of this episode of Don't Ignore the Elephant. Wow, I have no words. Where has Jazz been all my life? It makes me wonder how things might have turned out if I knew half of this stuff when I was getting bullied at school. I just love how she owns her space and doesn't let anyone tell her what she can and can't do. So what I want to know is this, which reality TV show are you going to apply for? And I might have to do a video challenge on socials to see how many of us can actually squat in heels. It's been a while since I've shimmied on a dance floor. I have to do a massive shout out to Rachel Bayliss who knitted her very own pink elephant during chemo for metastatic breast cancer. Keep your photos coming and the pattern details are in the show notes and all the profits go to the Institute of Cancer Research. I can't wait to see your photos. And I have to say thank you for all your wonderful comments about Debbie's episode. Rachel McElroy said she loved how Debbie was living her best life with the wisdom of age. And Anthea from Sydney said that Debbie was her fairy godmother when she was having cancer treatment and knitting helped her get through the dark days. We've now got over 50 comments in the jar of joy. Becky Ross said hers was singing ELO's I'm Alive at the top of her lungs when driving down the highway. We've all got a guilty pleasure driving song, haven't we? And this one made me cry. Janice Michael put on a coat she hadn't worn in ages and found a note in the pocket from a granddaughter that said, Gran, I love you. Remember to let me know what's made you smile this week. Next time, I'm going to be speaking to Felicity Cornelius Mercer about the reality of being the partner of someone in the public eye, using social media as a force for good and a little bit of swimming as well. If you enjoyed the show, make sure you subscribe and leave a review. I love knowing that the podcast really is making a difference. Thanks for listening and I'll be back next week. Thank you.